Grace and peace are yours from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What was he thinking? We normally ask that question with a little bit of puzzlement in our voice because we're shocked by someone's unexpected or unwise or bizarre behavior. Uh, the teenager jumps up onto his skateboard and then hops up onto that railing that goes along two flights of concrete steps and he tries to slide down that railing. Partway through he falls, not softly, onto the cement. What was he thinking? That was not going to end well. Or how about those people who run with the bulls in that town in Spain? Thousands of people cram themselves into these very crowded, narrow, winding city streets, and then they, they let 12 angry, raging, mad bulls go, and they try to outrun them. And you have that picture of that guy getting gorged, thrown up into the air, lands on the ground, and he gets trampled by 12 hoofs. What was he thinking? Today we ask that question, uh, not of a teenage daredevil or a middle-aged thrill-seeker, but of a patriarch, a hero of faith, the father of all believers, Abraham. What was he thinking? And we don't ask it with puzzlement in our voice as if we are somehow shocked by his bizarre behavior, but we ask that question with a little bit of awe in our voice, as if to say and to pray, Lord, give me a faith like Abraham's. What was he thinking? When he was 75 years old, God came to him and, and said, Abraham, you're going to have a son in your old age. And now that would have been difficult enough to process and digest, but then God made him wait 25 more years before he made good on that promise. If you thought 75 years was old enough to have a kid, how about 85? 95? 99 or 100 years old. You know, if they had Walgreens on every corner back then, just imagine how many home pregnancy tests Sarah would have purchased and how many would have been negative month after month after month for 25 years. Uh, that amount of time, though, taught Abraham an important lesson, that when God makes a promise, God keeps that promise but he does so on his time and in his way. And that amount of time, that, that amount of patient waiting on Abraham's part also, also prepared him, I suppose, for this moment here in our text when God comes to Abraham and says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Now that doesn't sound bad, and maybe Abraham was initially thinking as God was speaking, this sounds pretty good, a, a field trip, camping trip, a little, a little uh, quality time with me and my son. But then God goes on. Sacrifice him there. And how his heart must have sunk. Did Abraham sleep that night? I can't imagine that he could have. But we are told... Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey, taking with him two of his servants, his son Isaac, and all the wood that was necessary for the sacrifice, and he travels. For how long? Two whole days. What was that trip like? What was he thinking as he was traveling with his son? Uh, maybe, Lord, you promised that you would give me a son. Lord, you told me that I was going to be the father of many nations and that my descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Lord, you told me that Isaac, not Ishmael, not someone else, but Isaac was going to be the very one through whom you would keep this promise. Lord, you said that all nations would be blessed through me. Are you changing your mind? Have I lost favor with you? 
Are you angry with me for some reason? Are you punishing me? Are you getting back at me for my indiscretion with Hagar? Uh, are you getting back at Isaac? Did he do something wrong? What was he thinking? We're not entirely told, not specifically anyway. And had I been reading this account for the very first time, like I had never seen it before, I would not at all be surprised that when Abraham got this news, and if I were to keep reading in Genesis chapter 22, that I might have read words like this. Abraham got up early the next morning, he took his son Isaac, and he ran away. Abraham could have pulled a Jonah. You don't like what God has to say? Just run away. But that's not what happens. After traveling two whole days, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. What faith. What obedience to God. What determination, even in the face of such intense anguish and intense testing. Could I have done what Abraham did, or could you have done what Abraham did? I fear I would have crumbled. I fear I would have taken the easy way out or run away. In fact, sometimes I do feel like I have more in common with running away Jonah than I do with Abraham the faithful. But Abraham teaches us a very important lesson today. And it's this. It's not about you and me figuring out how we can muster up the strength to make it when the going gets tough. Uh, it's not about how you and me can somehow develop superhuman attributes. It's not that. Abraham teaches us that we already have a faithful, powerful, loving God. We already have a dependable God. Depend upon him. We already have a God who makes a promise and then keeps it. He always makes promises and he always keeps them. Trust him. And when that Lord God, our Father, happens to allow our faith to be tested and tried and, and we find ourselves in the eye of the storm, the purpose is so, not so that we could be carried away with the turbulence, but his only purpose is so that we would find firm footing and that we would have a refuge in him, in his arms, and in his word. Now, we may not have to, to undergo the same kinds of testing, specifically that Abraham did, but we will be tested. It's impossible to live in this sinful world that completely opposes God and not have our faith be tested. It's impossible to live with a sinful nature, and we all have one, and not be confronted with temptation every moment of every day. In that sense, we have a lot in common with Abraham. We are going to find our faith under test and trial time and time again. And so we cry out to the Lord, Lord, help me to love you more than I love myself. Help me to trust you more than I trust myself. Help me to appreciate your love for me, even when I can't see it because of life circumstances, and even when I can't always feel it in my heart. We could probably make several more comparisons between Abraham and us. Abraham, the father of believers, and, and we, the children of faith. But I want you to consider for just a few moments a different comparison. And that is between Isaac and Christ. Uh, Isaac was the only true beloved son of Abraham. Christ the only beloved son of God the Father. Isaac was the son of promise, delivered to Abraham after years and years of waiting, 
Christ was the son of promise delivered to God's people after years and years of waiting. Uh, Isaac was the miracle child born to Abraham in his old, old age. Christ was a miracle child, the son of God conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. How about this one? Isaac carries the wood to the place of sacrifice. Christ carries the wood of the cross to the place of sacrifice. Uh, Isaac, although he does speak, he inquires about the, the animal for sacrifice, and Abraham says the Lord will provide, and the Lord does. But beyond that, Isaac is silent. He goes without complaint. Christ, we're told he was led as a, as a sheep to the slaughter and he did not open his mouth. He goes without complaint. Now think of all those unique, interesting similarities, and yet there was one main difference. Isaac did not die at the hand of his father. Christ did. We talked a little bit about what Abraham must have been thinking when he considered sacrificing his own son. How about God the Father? What was he thinking? What was he thinking that he would ask his own dear beloved son to suffer and die in such a way? And for sinners, no less. What was he thinking? The answer? He was thinking about you. And he was making sure that all of your sins would be properly and fully paid for. Uh, he was making sure that your record before God would have no marks on it whatsoever, but would have just the right amount of perfection and holiness on it that only Jesus could provide. He, he was making sure that you would not be banished and separated from him because of your sin, but instead you would be brought close and you would be brought as part of his family because of Christ's atoning sacrifice. God is always thinking about you. He's not only thinking about one day when you will be with him in heaven forever and that day will come, but he's thinking about you right now. He's even thinking about you when you're going through some of those testing and trials to your faith. Even when you find yourself in the eye of the storm, he doesn't want you to be carried away by the turbulence, but to find firm footing, to find refuge in his arms, in his word, in the covenant of holy baptism, in the covenant of holy communion. You belong to me, God says. You are mine. I love you. Nothing can change that. Your sins are completely forgiven. That's God's promise. Believe it. You know, we'd all like a faith like Abraham's, I think, right? But it's not so much about you and me becoming more like Abraham. It's understanding that we have the same God Abraham had. We have the same loving, faithful, dependable, powerful, promise-keeping God that Abraham had. He's ours. Trust him. Amen.